So this 15 year old boy who have a tension like headache. Okay, that. Uh, so what do you guys do for him? He would rather stay in his room and tension like headache. What do, which one of these options can be the right? He's 15 with a change in behavior and he just doesn't want to go out. Mm. And the headaches are, they're not new, right? I have um, yeah. reports getting tension on cutting a few times a week for that trip with no physical concerns. Mm. Hmm. Not an MRI. So we we screen him for depression because it could be like he stay in his room and he's a fifteen year old. There we go. We have the psychiatrist here, so he doesn't ask <laughs> psychiatric questions. <laughs> yeah. So MRI. If there is, if we have uh, papal edema, nuchal rigidity, like early morning headache, that's the type of headache that we suspect brain tumor. That's when we use MRI. This case is not indicated. So toxicology can result in all that behavior like a drug abuse. But but this patient, like in the history, he didn't say that he's taking any drugs. He's not ta he's not using drugs. Mm -hmm. So I think we should just believe him. Alright. Yeah. And anyway, we screen him for depression would be better because that's a history taken. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's a, that's about it. Family therapy sometimes like maybe sometimes it's helpful to see the family dysfunction can cause him to have issues, but first we screen for depression is better. Okay, so this is a thirty-year-old female. Okay. So grab what it do up. you tell her about her abortion? Yeah, go ahead. How many abortions does she come to the office for preconception counseling? First pregnancy and then she's a cesarean due to fetal malpresentation. She's now with a new partner. First trimester spontaneous abortion. So she's only had two? She two had only one abortion. Um, what do you tell her regarding spontaneous abortion? Decreased caffeine, decreased amount of exercise, carry up analysis, no patients and increased the vanilla. During history spontaneous, the previous she this is only her first one, right? Previous cesarean increased the risk of possibly. Hmm. I well, this is her very first spontaneous abortion, so I think I'd probably go with choice E, previous cesarean. Delivery increases risk of spontaneous abortion. I'm not too sure, but I think that makes much more sense. Okay, how about you, Nina? Yeah, so she's only been pregnant twice, right? The first time with the C-section and the second time with the trim first trimester abortion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... It's, it's not choice B. Care type analysis is indicated to determine the risk. I don't think it's choice C either. Patient is or her history. So this page, this is the topic about about the spontaneous abortion. So which is the pregnancy loss less than 20 weeks mm -hmm. gestation. Risk factors is the advanced maternal age, number one. Second thing is previous spontaneous abortion. And the third thing is that substance abuse. Mm -hmm. So those are the biggest risk factors for spontaneous abortion. So how do you manage it? It's just expectant or you can do medical induction like misoprostol. And you can do suction curatage if there's an infection. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. We had one time a patient who just presented with a... She, was, she thought that she was pregnant and they did the transvaginal ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And the doctor told her, oh, you don't have the baby anymore. She lost it oh. without her uh, knowing. So they gave her misoprostol and stuff. Like that. Yeah. But she had hemo she was hemodynamically stable. If she was hemodynamically unstable, then they would do suction curative. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do RHD immunoglobulin for abor abortion. Mm -hmm. And we do pathology examination just to see why did that happen. 
and spontaneous abortion can be complicated to hemorrhage, retain the product of conception, uterine perforation, and intrauterine adhesion. Uh, so that's a uh, thing. So can previous cesarean delivery, huh? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so previous cesarean delivery, it's not a risk factor for spontaneous abortion. Exercise, oh. it's not too. Caffeine is not too. So all of these exercise, caffeine, caesar, c-section are not risk factors of for spontaneous abortion. The she increases spontaneous due to her history of prior spontaneous abortion. So that was they keep repeating this question even in the CK there was a question like this. Yeah. Okay, question. This lady in the case scenario didn't have a history. So are we talking about the future? Like I didn't, you know, that's why I didn't pick that. I I know that you know you can, it's a risk factor, but. Like, yeah. Yeah. So the biggest, yeah, the biggest risk factor is the previous spontaneous abortion. True, but the way the question is asking, what do we tell her about spontaneous abortion? It sounded like now she wants to know, but yeah, she didn't yeah. have it before. I guess because um, I guess the question is worded very poorly, but I guess because yeah, yeah. she. Sorry. So I didn't bring. The, so these are numbers. So it's gravity two. Para one, aborta one. So this is, <laughs> that's what I was asking. Yeah, you. sorry, those are the numbers. Yeah. So awesome. this is abortion. Yeah. So she had abortion already. So this one you do. It. She had two pregnancy and she only delivered one. So that's okay. how you tell. Like G two P one. That means she has abortion one. Abortion. So she had a history of previous abortion. From this G two P one, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It was that the those numbers in this thing. Yeah, so that's the idea of this question. And the spontaneous abortion can be due to chromosomal abnormalities, mm. like mosaicism, overstrain translocation, can cause that. But there's nothing mentioned in this case. And usually, chromosomal abnormalities, they have mosaicism, or they have more than three spontaneous abortion. This patient had one only. So that's a risk factor for it. So what were the complications of spontaneous abortion? Can you yeah, go over? It can be hemorrhage, infection, or adhesion, or it can cause uterine perforation. Uterine what? Perforation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is an interesting case. She's a 75-year-old female who presented with a two-week history of palpitations, fatigue, heat intolerance, weight loss. Thyroid ultrasound shows multinodular goiter with increased vascularity. On follow-up, two days later, the patient reports partial relief uh, of her symptoms. Now the blood pressure is 135 over 80. 34 over 80. Okay. So what do you manage? How do you manage this patient? And she had, that's the big clue too. She had angiography. So angiography, they add contrast, iodine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest clue is that after contrast, after iodine contrast, she developed hyperthyroid symptom. What is this diagnosis and how do we manage it? That's the main idea of this question. Uh, yeah, so exactly. At this one, she had hyperthyroid symptoms. And she had, she had partial improvement of her symptoms. Okay, So I want to give her methamazole right now. Because this iodine goes to the thyroid and increases the production of thyroid hormone. That's the problem. The predisposing factor is that when you have nodular thyroid disease or chronic iodine deficiency mm. and with the radio contrast agent, that's what exacerbates the symptoms. When they have, they tell you they have angiography or radio contrast agent, that can, can even have an after amiodarone. 
-hmm. They call it amyodarana induced aerotoxicosis too. And uh, so that's the idea. They have hyperthyroid symptoms. Usually you have decreased TSH, negative thyrotropin receptor antibodies so because it's not Graves, it's iodine induced hyperthyroidism. And in the ultrasound, you have increased vascularity and you can have possible nodules. So how do you manage it? First, you give beta blocker for symptom control. Second thing, you give antithyroid medication for one to two months. Okay. And uh, severe thyrotoxicosis or older patients with cardiac disease, those are at risk too. So we got to... We gotta treat them for this for these mm -hmm. things. Good. So because it can worsen their condition. So right. that's, the, that's that's the main idea of this question. So it's the contrast induced hyperthyroidism basically? Yeah, iodine induced hyperthyroidism as I will call it. Yeah. So prednisone, when do we use prednisone? I thought we used it in thyrotoxicosis. Yeah, it can, it can be used to thyrotoxicosis, like when there's, you have thyroid storm, we use that, decreased peripheral conversion. And another thing, it's used with decovariant thyroiditis, mm. or destructive type 2, amyodarone-induced thyroiditis can be caused for that. Okay, how about potassium iodine? Iodide therapy, what is that? When do we use that? Or radioactive iodine therapy, when do we use that? Treatment of graves. So there is a phenomena, you guys, it's, it's uh, maybe you may not get to ask about it. Like this, there's a weird phenomena when you give iodine solution. This will decrease the release of thyroid hormone and inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis due to impaired organification of the iodine in the thyroid follicle. They call it wolf chiaco phenomenon. You guys remember that? This was step one thing. You guys remember? Vaguely. Hey. Hey. Huh? Vaguely. Hey. Yeah, yeah. So this when you give iodine, like this is like a weird phenomenon. And radioactive iodine ablation, if you guys remember, it's for Graves' disease. <laughs> That's uh, the definitive management for radio uh, for Graves disease. Okay, so that's the idea of this question. So uh, let's see this one. So this 50-year-old man who brought to the emergency department the chest pain, lightheadedness for the past hour. Okay, he went well. He was clearing the snow on. So that's snow, you know. It's a Really good screening tool for MI. Okay, so now you have ST elevation. What do you do? So here, there we go. Here they give us a diagnosis. Yeah. Do another information here. The heart rate is 34. Is oh. that gonna change your management? Kind of. Yeah. So your answer was right, but now if I change it to 34, what would be your answer? How would your answer change? Atropine. Yeah, excellent. Because uh, you give IV fluid, you're right. But if I give you the heart rate 34, so your answer was right. But if I add 34, then it would be a tropin. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's, it's a case specific. So why not uh, deputamine? This one for cardiogenic shock. Okay, why not epinephrine? Like you guys remember the algorithm for bradycardia? So a patient who have bradycardia and have symptoms like heart failure, um, like those shock symptoms, hemodynamic instability, lightheadedness. So if you, they have any of these symptoms, symptomatic or chest pain too, like this one symptomatic of bradycardia too, chest pain. If any of those, we give atropine. If that didn't work, then we go for cardiac pacing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the like cause transcutaneous pacing. If it didn't work, then we give dubutamine, epinephrine, 
If that didn't work, then they do a transvenous pacing. So that, those are second lines afterward. Why not nitroglycerin? I think it'll be harmful because they'll dilate. Exactly. It's very harmful. If you want to kill the patient, you give him nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin you give him for a patient who have a heart failure and hypertension. Mm. That's when you do it, like it's for a hypertension emergency because it's venodilator, like it's a, it's a emergency. or for anginal episode, anginal pain too. Okay, let's go. This case is interesting too. Let's see. So she's a 29-year-old female, okay, I have contractions every three minutes, uh, the pelvic exam dilated to 5 cm, okay, so the main thing is that I want you guys to pay attention to, she's a 33 weeks gestation and mm -hmm. she's having contractions, so what is that, that's all what you need to know. That's what I want you guys to focus on. Is that Isn't normal? Hmm? She's, having, she's in labor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, she's having cervical dilation. Come on, what's going on? Just wait, hold on a second, like seven more weeks. Just hold on. No, no the baby just want to get out. He's excited for the li for life. See what he's wanna... Because he wants to study for USM at least early. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> so, so what do you do for this baby? He's excited for USM. She's already five centimeters dilated, right? And she's 30, 33 weeks. Yeah, excellent. It's intramuscular beta metason because this is a preterm labor. That's what's mm -hmm. going on. So the preterm labor, if it's less than 32 weeks, then I give beta metason to coalesces, which is endomethacin, and magnesium sulfate and penicillin if GPS unknown. But if it's 32 weeks to 34, then I'll give her beta metason to coalesces and penicillin if GPS is unknown. Mm -hmm. If it's more than 34 to 36 or 37, we give her beta methasone, either we give her or not, but penicillin if GPS is positive or not. So penicillin we give it in every preterm, whether G if GPS is positive or not. And the only difference in 33, 32 to 33 and 6 days, we give tocolysis, that's the addition. If it's less than 32, then we add magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. So that's why. That's why it's not magnesium. This one is less than 32. Endomethacin, usually less than 32. They give it for tocolysis too. And endomethacin more than 32 can increase risk of oligohydramnio and premature closure of fetal ductus arteriosus. When do we use vaginal progesterone? So this one, if you guys remember, like some females have short cervix. So they have high risk to lose the baby. Their cervix are not long enough to, pr to hold the baby. Why? Due to lack of progesterone. So they give them vaginal progesterone for patients with short cervix. Less than 2 cm. That's how they do it. Okay. And usually they found it in the second trimester and they give her they keep giving her vaginal progesterone and stuff just to keep uh, making the cervix stronger to hold the baby. Okay, so that's it. So beta methasone is why? Why do we give beta methasone? For the lungs. Huh? For the lungs. Yeah, excellent. What else? So it's kind of protecting your natal respiratory distress syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis, intraventricular hemorrhage, 
Like that's that's what I know. That's what protect against those. Okay, so those are the management for the... Yeah, so this one, I think we talked about it. So when you have Glasgow, Glasgow comma scale is 8. So this is what I want you guys to know. This mnemonic, below 8, intubate. Okay, so this patient, what do we do? What do you guys think was the management? Well, he's only 8. And he's responding with his eyes. So, where is this knife lodged in? Hmm. Is that in his head, the knife? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, we just sent the patient to the OR. Intubate. Yeah, so this is my fault. I should have made it more clear. So it's if it's eight or below eight. Oh, <laughs> yeah. then intubate. I changed my choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my my fault. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, if it's eight or below eight, we intubate. All right. So that's the thing. Local wound management, like right now, is not the issue. Right now is. He's going to have low oxygen and he may die at any moment. Mm -hmm. and if we remove the knife, it may lead to increased bleeding. Yeah. So the going of dural venous sinus is pressure. That's why, does. That's why we have to do it in the operating room. Yeah. Okay. And the first thing, ABC, that's all the time. At least transport him and stuff afterward. All the time is ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. Airway comes first, intubates. So those are the glos so the Glasgow Como scale. There are we have three items, three parameters. We have the eye response, we give the four point, and the verbal response, and the motor response. Okay, the eye four points, verbal five points, motor six points. Okay, so that's that's the difference. Here, like you give him, how much do you give for each? And you manage accordingly. So this patient. It was an 84 year old guy. With this issue, what do you guys want to do for him? Excellent, yeah, good memory. Yeah, so if the patient is on his space, is well differentiated, invasive, squamous cell carcinoma, you can go, you give radiotherapy, cryotherapy, electro surgery, those we can, you can give all any of these. Okay. So that's the idea. Palliative care, photodynamic. Why not photodynamic therapy? This one is called like the photodynamic. They use it for actinic keratosis, which is a precancerous. And squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Bowen disease, which is squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Or even 5 fluorouracil. We give it for actinic keratosis, not for cancer. Why not chemotherapy? That's his stomach. It's on his face. Yeah, right? makes sense for metastatic, yeah. How about BRAF? Why not a BRAF? Do you guys know what's the name of the medication, this medication? No, I don't. It's called Vimorafinib. What is that for? Huh? What is that for? Melanoma. Okay. Hemorrhage. That's for melanoma. Okay, so that's the idea of this patient. Okay, let's see. So this one is interesting. They say what increased risk for colon cancer? So you see, the question is too long, but if you just, you just either you know it or not, that's it. So which one increases risk for colon cancer? Uh, 
You guys, if you guys able to interpret from this little bold words here, maybe you will be able to know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he drinks three, four. But even if I if I don't if he doesn't if I don't tell you how much he drinks, so there there mm -hmm. are the risk factors for colon. So this question is about risk factors of colon cancer. That's what mm -hmm. I like about these questions. Each question like carry a topic inside of it. So mm -hmm. the familial adenomatous polyposis, inflammatory bowel disease, and African American. Those are. Uh, non-modifiable you can have it like you're born with it and there are other risk factors which, are, which is modifiable alcohol intake cigarette smoking and obesity and the study is shown even moderate intake like two to three drinks a day is associated with increased risk of colon cancer and the highest with heavy drinkers who drink more than four drinks a day okay and uh, alcohol uh, like smoking so increased risk if it's only you have you're smoking one pack a day for more than 30 years that's increased risk but even though alcohol is still stronger risk factors okay so that the protective effect for cancer is the high fiber diet so this one rich and the fruits and vegetables regular non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use Actually, some studies is very interesting. They say aspirin like protect from colon cancer because the cox it goes to the genes and the cox their proton cogene. So you guys remember like the so the reason for cancer, there are two types of uh, genes, the one that are tumor suppressor gene and the proton cogene. Remember crazy like Dr. Najib, you explained them like for eight hours and stuff like was <laughs> big like all the genes and uh, each gene and interact with the others and it's very complex process so i'll show you how how great the human creature is and how this complex biological design it's it's made by someone like it's it's a very interesting like to see how this molecular biology work and affect each other so if you if there's imbalance between if the tumor if the if one of the tumor suppressor gene get destroyed for example retinoblastoma it's a tumor suppressor or even neurofibromatosis one two those are tumor suppressors so once you lose them the cells tend to proliferate and causes cancers and causes these all these uh, types of issues and for leukemia and stuff the protoencogen like AML there was a there is an there is a gene that uh, stimulate the proliferation of the molecules that's why it causes cancers and can mess up a whole human life on the one single gene so it's very interesting and each one of us have more than 99 mutation every day but we have the immune system that would uh, destroy the destroy the cancerous cells so it's very interesting process like an immuno immunology so the protective factors is the high fiber diet and non steroid anti inflammatory drug, exercise, and hormone replacement therapy. So, those are protective factors. Okay, so let's see this patient. So, this patient is having cirrhosis. So, how do you manage him? So this patient, I'll tell you, he's a 54-year-old guy, mm -hmm. present with exertional dyspnea and non-productive cough, and he has a cirrhosis. There is lower extremity edema and shifting dullness on the abdomen. Alkaline phosphatase is high. AST, ALT are high. Okay, so what do you, what do you do for him? And he's even having pleural effusion because of his cirrhosis. I think you should give him uh, choice B. How about you, Mina? What do you think? Yeah, I agree. A lot of these ones, I would, I mean, he's not bleeding or anything like that, right? So, yeah, I would go with furosemide, spironolactone. Why not the other ones? No. 
Yeah, exactly. That's what the idea is. So when you have cirrhosis and the pleural effusion, they call it hepatic hydrothorax. So that's what the presence causes right sided, transitive or exudative. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. hmm? Transitive. I think it's transitive. Excellent. Yeah, tra because protein loss. And so transitive. First, you do sodium restriction and diuretic. And then you give, if it didn't work, then you give the transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt used in refractory cases. Okay, so that's, that's, a, but there is a risk for that because it can cause hepatic encephalopathy, hepatic decompensation. So that's why we leave a last resort. Uh, placement of indwelling catheter is also is a poor treatment for that because every time it's going to keep reaccumulating so there is no cause for that there's no it's not a good management how about chemical fluorodesis what is that that's for that thing it's um i forget it's like sort of like pus empyema or something yeah so this one they 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 involve installation of an irritant, which is a talc, they call it. They ingest it into the pleural space, and that talc causes inflammation and fibrosis. That's why I inhibit the recurrent effusion. That's most likely used for malignancy, malignant exudative pleural mm -hmm. effusion. Okay, not for hepatic hydrothorax. Okay, that's the idea of this patient. So, let's go to this one. Okay, so risks and benefits of hormone replacement therapy. She's a 54-year-old female. So that's the idea of this question. So hormone replacement therapy, it has estrogen and progesterone. So this causes increases the cog, increases coagula, coagulation factors, causes hypercoagulability. And in Virchow's triad, we have three: hypercoagulability, endothelial injury. Okay, and so those are one of the symptoms that can cause thrombus. So it increases risk of stroke, even if your blood pressure is well controlled. The mortality, so it can it causes endometrial cancer, mm -hmm. and uh, it can, but that's and increases risk also for for breast cancer too. But that's not as strong as the stroke. Mm -hmm. It can increase risk of stroke. So heart disease um, increases risk of heart disease. Why the treatment should be uh, heart disease? Mo they, so the heart disease mostly it's, it's after 60 years old. Right. That's why, yeah, because you know the women are protected from heart because they have estrogen. Right, right, right. Yeah, because like like in men, if it's more than 40, you suspect heart attack. But in women, more than 60, like so. Yeah. They are less likely to die from a heart attack than guys. Yeah, after menopause, they're like men. Yeah. Yeah. So you you have this advantage, like of the estrogen protective, and uh, even protect from diabetes because it decreases insulin resistance. So that's the thing. So the answer here is the stroke. Okay. Yeah. Because of thrombosis, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So there are the detrimental effect of uh, her of the hormone replacement therapies that thromboemboli, breast cancer, stroke, gallbladder disease, and heart disease only if age more than sixty. Okay. And the beneficial, we all know, it, it benefit heart flashes, vaginal atrophy bone fracture, colon cancer, type 2 diabetes, okay, all-cause mortality, and the, the one that has a neutral effect doesn't affect or prevent the congenital, co so, sorry, cognition, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, and all-cause mortality more than 60 years old. It can affect that. So all of those have a neutral response. Wait, so it has no effect on breast cancer? 
No, it increases risk of breast cancer. Oh, increases risk, okay. Yeah. And endometrial cancer increased only with unopposed estrogen. Okay. okay. So this one is a very interesting case in a 72-year-old guy with a blood pressure 75 over 45. So what do you guys think? So we are saying he's having inferior wall MR, right? So next was the yeah. men decrease the vagal tone, increase absolute. I think we should optimize the preload. How about you, Mina? What do you think? Inferior MI, yeah, I agree. Yeah, exactly. That's the most important thing for patient with a right heart MI. So why not decrease vagal tone? This patient, we give them only if they have heart rate 34, like the case that we had. Okay, but this patient pulse is 60, so he's okay. So why not increase after after load? What do you guys think? That would kill him. Exactly. That will increase the stress on his MI. Inotropic agent is the same. How about thrombolytic therapy? Why not that? You could give it after you stabilize him, I guess. Exactly, yeah. After you stabilize him and you give that. And even, so we, we give thrombolytic, even pulmonary embolism, if he's unstable too, mm -hmm. we give thrombolysis too in this case. I'm sorry, why did you say not the vagal thing? So atropine, atropine is muscarinic antagonist, so it decreases the vagal tone on the heart. Mm -hmm. So that's why it increases contractility. So the vagal, decreases vagal tone, which means they mean atropine, that's what they mean. This okay. will give it if the heart rate is low, like 34, uh. like body cut, like the question that we just had. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this patient, she's a 29-year-old female with a PTH of 700 and calcium of 12. So what do you guys want to do for this patient? Those are all really high, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll Those are both elevated? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The PTH 700? Yeah. I'll Calcium is 12. Okay. And phosphate is 1.9. I think we did this one too, actually. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm going to. Is it a parathyroidectomy? Because she has primary hyperparathyroid, right? Yeah, exactly. This is a primary hyperparathyroidism. So this is, so look at this. So this one, I change it. Okay, so this is primary hyperparathyroidism. What if I change it, okay? Uh, if I told you the PTH is 700, calcium is 7, phosphate PO4 is 5. What's your diagnosis now? Secondary. So this one, primary, hyper, what is secondary? You said secondary? <laughs> I don't know. Secondary hyperthyroid. Hyperthyroid? i sorry, hyperparathyroid. Why? Because the PTH is still high, but the calcium is low. <laughs> yeah, the secondary calcium will be high, right? <laughs> So this one, this is a tough one. It's called pseudo oh. hypoparathyroidism because the PTH is high, but so the problem in the cell are resistant to PTH. Mm. So there was they they had a case like this. It was tricky. So the pseudo. Is, is phosphate high or no? Phosphate is really high. Five is really high. 
No, no, it's two. So that's a pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Uh, so it's not actual hypoparathyroidism. But the actual hypoparathyroidism, they will have the PTH is low. PTH is low, like the normal, like 20 or something. And CA decrease too. And PO4 is 5. Same like this. Okay, so that's, that's the confusing part between these. So this metanephrine, when you have headache, palpitation, and stuff. Wait, I'm sorry. What was that, that last one that you wrote? The PTH20 calcium 7? This one, hypoparathyroidism. Oh, hypo. Okay. Not pseudo. Okay, so this. That's the thing. Yeah, so this this patient. So what are the men? Multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. What is that? So men type 1 is the 3P, pituitary, Parathyroid, pituitary, pancreas. Yes. So pituitary adenoma in 20% of the cases, primary hyperparathyroidism in 90% of the cases, and 70% of the cases pancreatic cancer. So pituitary adenoma can have prolactinoma, an increased growth hormone, increased ACTH, or non-functioning can present with headache and visual defect. Primary hyperparathyroidism, uh, it causes multiple thyroid adenoma, parathyroid adenoma or parathyroid hyperplasia, causes increased calcium. So what are the symptoms of an increased calcium? Polyuria, kidney stone, decreased bone density, those are, they have nausea, vomiting, those are the symptoms. And pancreatic and gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumor, they can have gastrinoma. Well, how does that present? Ulcers. And selenoma? Huh? How about and selenoma? Insulinoma? Yeah. How does that present, you're saying? Yeah. Hypoglycemia? Excellent. How about vipoma? Oh, yeah. Vipoma. Diarrhea. Plus hypokalemia and hypochloridia. How about glucagonoma? How does that present? No, that's like rash and increased sugars. Yeah, that's rash. They call it necrolytic migratory erythema, mm -hmm. and hyperglycemia and weight loss. Yeah, yeah, excellent. You're right, yeah. So this one, calcitonin and metanephrine for men too, and okay. for Zollinger Ellison syndrome. So that's the comparison. Can you go over that last one that you had? Hmm? The, uh, gastronoma, uh, glucagonoma, you said? No, in the values. Can you go up? Oh, the values? Okay. okay. So this patient is a 30-year-old uh, Caucasian male who present with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. What do you guys want to give him? So he has salmonella. Yeah. Is it body diarrhea or no? Salmonella, that's all that you need to know. Give him super. Let me give you the other option. Oh, a poor kid. Hmm? Support him. <laughs> How about you, Mina? How do you think? Supportive therapy. Yeah, excellent. This salmonella, there is no need to do antibiotic for that patient. You just do supportive therapy. And you give antibiotic only in... in so this... There's no need to be in, in immunocompetent individuals, mm. age 12 also, or older. There's no need to do antibiotics for this patient. Okay. So why not Cipro? When do we use that? Cipro, TMP, SMX? UTIs. Yeah, or we can give ETEC, intratoxygenic E. coli, when they have traveler diarrhea. And if it's so severe, then we, we give them that. How about Siftriaxone? 
Gonorrhea. Hmm? Yeah, gonorrhea. And uh, septic arthritis, meningitis. Uh, those dangerous stuff. We keep it for these dangerous stuff. How about ampicillin? Added to meningitis. Yeah, for which bug? For... No. Egalactia? Listeria? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Listeria, exactly, yeah. Okay, so, so, so that's about it. Okay, so let's do a rapid review of what we discussed. So, so how to manage primary hyperparathyroidism? Parathyroidectomy. So what is the men one? The three P's. Pancreas, pituitary, para, uh, hyperparathyroidism. Excellent. How do we manage inferior MI with bradycardia versus normal heart rate? Bradycardia do atropine and normal heart rate give fluids. So how to manage hepatic hydrothorax? You give them pure semispironolactone and sodium restriction. Okay. What are the risk factors for colon cancer? Good. Uh, you said all of those were, right? Hmm? Did you say all of those were? Because I couldn't really hear properly. Yeah. I know alcohol is. Yeah, yeah, alcohol, smoking, obesity. What's protective for colon okay. cancer? Nothing. Hmm? Protective? Yeah. Not smoking and drinking? I don't know. Yeah, high fiber, hormone replacement therapy, and exercise, and non steroid anti inflammatory drugs. That's what you mean. You said hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, yeah. And what else? And sets and what else? And high fiber diet. There was a fourth one you said. Non steroid anti inflammatory drugs. So high fiber, HRT, NSAIDs, anything else? Exercise. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Regular exercise. Yeah. And they say like the processed meat that we buy, like this one that you put in the microwave, increases risk of colon cancer four times. Yeah. And this was an interesting study too. I do that a lot, and so I should be careful. Yeah, I'll try not to process yeah. stuff, even yeah, though I, I should, love it. I should cook. Yeah. It's hard to. Yeah, but sometimes we don't have time for it. So Glasgow Coma Scale is 8, what do you do? Intubate. Preterm at 30 week gestation, what do you give him? How many weeks? 30, yeah. Oh, 30? Yeah. Um, steroids, magnesium, and tocolytics. Yeah, excellent. How what about GBS prophylaxis? Do we do that? Hmm? GBS, if it's unknown. Do we do that too? Yeah, we give penicillin too. For GBS unknown. So, how about patient? What are the risk factors for spontaneous abortion? Having previous history of it. Or substance abuse or advanced maternal age. Okay. Yeah. Well, so that's that's the main issue for this for this discussion. Okay, so do you guys have any question? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Okay. So we will we will do the next session the CCS, okay? Yes.